The Mound by H. P. Lovecraft for Zelia Bishop Chapter 7 When I looked up from my half-stupefied reading and note-taking, the morning sun was high in the heavens. The electric bulb was still burning, but such things of the real world, the modern outer world, were far from my whirling brain. I knew I was in my room at Clyde Compton's at Binger, but upon what monstrous vista had I stumbled? Was this thing a hoax, or a chronicle of madness? If a hoax, was it a jest of the sixteenth century, or of today? The manuscript's age looked appallingly genuine to my not wholly unpractised eyes, and the problem presented by the strange metal cylinder I dared not even think about. Moreover, what a monstrously exact explanation it gave of all the baffling phenomena of the mound, of the seemingly meaningless and paradoxical actions of diurnal and nocturnal ghosts, and of the queer cases of madness and disappearance. It was even an accursedly plausible explanation, evilly consistent, if one could adopt the incredible. It must be a shocking hoax devised by someone who knew all the lore of the mound. There was even a hint of social satire in the account of that unbelievable netherworld of horror and decay. Surely this was the clever forgery of some learned cynic. Something like the leaden crosses in New Mexico, which a jester once planted and pretended to discover as a relic of some forgotten Dark Age colony from Europe. Upon going down to breakfast, I hardly knew what to tell Compton and his mother as well as the curious callers who had already begun to arrive. Still in a daze, I cut the Gordian knot by giving a few points from the notes I had made, and mumbling my belief that the thing was a subtle and ingenious fraud left there by some previous explorer of the mound, a belief in which everybody seemed to concur when told of the substance of the manuscript. It is curious how all that breakfast group and all the others in Binger to whom the discussion was repeated, seemed to find a great clearing of the atmosphere in the notion that somebody was playing a joke on somebody. For the time, we all forgot that the known recent history of the mound presented mysteries as strange as any in the manuscript, and as far from acceptable solution as ever. The fears and doubts began to return when I asked for volunteers to visit the mound with me. I wanted a larger excavating party, but the idea of going to that uncomfortable place seemed no more attractive to the people of Binger than it had seemed on the previous day. I myself felt a mounting horror upon looking toward the mound and glimpsing the moving speck which I knew was the daylight sentinel, for in spite of all my skepticism, the morbidities of that manuscript stuck by me and gave everything connected with the place a new and monstrous significance. I absolutely lacked the resolution to look at the moving speck with my binoculars. Instead, I set out with the kind of bravado we display in nightmares, when, knowing we are dreaming, we plunge desperately into still thicker horrors for the sake of having the whole thing over the sooner. My pick and shovel were already out there, so I had only my handbag of smaller paraphernalia to take. Into this I put the strange cylinder and its contents, feeling vaguely that I might possibly find something worth checking up with some part of the green-lettered Spanish text. Even a clever hoax might be founded on some actual attribute of the mound which a former explorer had discovered, and that magnetic metal was damnably odd. Grey Eagle's cryptic talisman still hung from its leathern cord around my neck. I did not look very sharply at the mound as I walked toward it, but when I reached it there was nobody in sight. Repeating my upward scramble of the previous day, I was troubled by thoughts of what might lie close at hand if, by any miracle, any part of the manuscript were actually half true. In such a case, I could not help reflecting, the hypothetical Spaniard Zamacona must have barely reached the outer world when overtaken by some disaster perhaps an involuntary rematerialization. He would naturally, in that event, have been seized by whichever sentry happened to be on duty at the time, either the discredited freeman, or, as a matter of supreme irony, the very Tlayob 
which had planned and aided his first attempt at escape, and in the ensuing struggle the cylinder with the manuscript might well have been dropped on the mound's summit, to be neglected and gradually buried for nearly four centuries. But, I added, as I climbed over the crest, one must not think of extravagant things like that. Still, if there were anything in the tale, it must have been a monstrous fate to which Zamakona had been dragged back. The amphitheater. Mutilation. Duty somewhere in the dark nitrous tunnel as a dead-alive slave, a maimed corpse fragment as an automatic interior sentry. It was a very real shock which caused this morbid speculation from my head, for upon glancing around the elliptical summit, I saw at once that my pick and shovel had been stolen. This was a highly provoking and disconcerting development, baffling, too, in view of the seeming reluctance of all the Binger folk to visit the mound. Was this reluctance a pretended thing, and had the jokers of the village been chuckling over my coming discomfiture as they solemnly saw me off ten minutes before? I took out my binoculars and scanned the gaping crowd at the edge of the village. No, they did not seem to be looking for any comic climax. Yet was not the whole affair, at bottom, a colossal joke, in which all the villagers and reservation people were concerned. Legends, manuscript, cylinder, and all. I thought of how I had seen the sentry from a distance, and then found him unaccountably vanished. Thought also of the conduct of Old Grey Eagle, of the speech and expressions of Compton and his mother, and of the unmistakable fright of most of the Binger people. On the whole, it could not very well be a village-wide joke. The fear and the problem were surely real, though obviously there were one or two jesting daredevils in Binger who had stolen out to the mound and made off with the tools I had left. Everything else on the mound was as I had left it, brush cut by my machete, slight bowl-like depression toward the north end, and the hole I had made with my trench knife in digging up the magnetism-revealed cylinder. Deeming it too great a concession to the unknown jokers to return to Binger for another pick and shovel, I resolved to carry out my program as best I could with the machete and trench knife in my handbag. So, extracting these, I set to work excavating the bowl-like depression which my eye had picked as the possible site of a former entrance to the mound. As I proceeded, I felt again the suggestion of a sudden wind blowing against me, which I had noticed the day before, a suggestion which seemed stronger and still more reminiscent of unseen, formless, opposing hands laid upon my wrists, as I cut deeper and deeper through the root-tangled red soil and reached the exotic black loam beneath. The talisman around my neck appeared to twitch oddly in the breeze, not in any one direction, as when attracted by the buried cylinder, but vaguely and diffusely, in a manner wholly unaccountable. Then, quite without warning, the black, root-woven earth beneath my feet began to sink cracklingly, while I heard a faint sound of sifting, falling matter far below me. The obstructing wind, or forces, or hands, now seemed to be operating from the very seat of the sinking, and I felt that they aided me by pushing as I leaped back out of the hole to avoid being involved in any cave-in. Bending down over the brink, and hacking at the mold-caked root-tangle with my machete, I felt that they were against me, but at no time were they strong enough to stop my work. The more roots I severed, the more falling matter I heard below. Finally, the hole began to deepen of itself toward the center, and I saw that the earth was sifting down into some large cavity beneath, so as to leave a good-sized aperture when the roots that had bound it were gone. A few more hacks of the machete did the trick, and with a parting cave-in and uprush of curiously chill and alien air, the last barrier gave way. Under the morning sun yawned a huge opening at least three feet square, and showing the top of a flight of stone steps down which the loose earth of the collapse was still sliding. My quest had come to something at last. With an elation of accomplishment, almost overbalancing fear for the nonce, I replaced the trench knife and machete in my handbag, 
took out my powerful electric torch and prepared for a triumphant, lone, and utterly rash invasion of the fabulous nether world I had uncovered. It was rather hard getting down the first few steps, both because of the fallen earth which had choked them, and because of a sinister up-pushing of a cold wind from below. The talisman around my neck swayed curiously, and I began to regret the disappearing square of daylight above me. The electric torch showed dank, water-stained, and salt-encrusted walls, fashioned of huge basalt blocks, and now and then I thought I descried some trace of carving beneath the nitrous deposits. I gripped my handbag more tightly, and was glad of the comforting weight of the sheriff's heavy revolver in my right-hand coat pocket. After a time, the passage began to wind this way and that, and the staircase became free from obstructions. Carvings on the walls were now definitely traceable, and I shuddered when I saw how clearly the grotesque figures resembled the monstrous bas-reliefs on the cylinder I had found. Winds and forces continued to blow malevolently against me, and at one or two bends I half fancied the torch gave glimpses of thin, transparent shapes, not unlike the sentinel on the mound, as my binoculars had showed him. When I reached this stage of visual chaos, I stopped for a moment to get a grip on myself. It would not do to let my nerves get the better of me at the very outset of what would surely be a trying experience and the most important archaeological feat of my career. But I wished I had not stopped at just that place, for the act fixed my attention on something profoundly disturbing. It was only a small object lying close to the wall on one of the steps below me, but that object was such as to put my reason to a severe test and bring up a line of the most alarming speculations that the opening above me had been closed against all material forms for generations was utterly obvious from the growth of shrub roots and accumulation of drifting soil, yet the object before me was most distinctly not many generations old, for it was an electric torch, much like the one I now carried, warped and encrusted in the tomb-like dampness, but nonetheless perfectly unmistakable. I descended a few steps and picked it up, wiping off the evil deposits on my rough coat. One of the nickel bands bore an engraved name and address, and I recognized it with a start the moment I made it out. It read, James C. Williams, 17 Trowbridge Street, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I knew it had belonged to one of the two daring college instructors who had disappeared on June 28, 1915 only thirteen years ago, and yet I had just broken through the sod of centuries. How had the thing got there? Another entrance, or was there something after all in this mad idea of dematerialization and rematerialization? Doubt and horror grew upon me as I wound still farther down the seemingly endless staircase. Would the thing never stop? The carvings grew more and more distinct, and assumed a narrative pictorial quality, which brought me close to panic as I recognized many unmistakable correspondences with the history of Knayan as sketched in the manuscript now resting in my handbag. For the first time, I began seriously to question the wisdom of my descent, and to wonder whether I had not better return to the upper air before I came upon something which would never let me return as a sane man. But I did not hesitate long, for as a Virginian, I felt the blood of ancestral fighters and gentlemen adventurers pounding a protest against retreat from any peril, known or unknown. My descent became swifter rather than slower, and I avoided studying the terrible bas-reliefs and intaglios that had unnerved me. All at once I saw an arched opening ahead, and realized that the prodigious staircase had ended at last. But with that realization came horror and mounting magnitude, for before me there yawned a vast vaulted crypt of all too familiar outline, a great circular space answering in every least particular to the carving-lined chamber described in the Zamakona manuscript. It was indeed the place, there could be no mistake, 
and if any room for doubt yet remained, that room was abolished by what I saw directly across the great vault. It was a second arched opening, commencing a long narrow passage, and having at its mouth two huge opposite niches bearing loathsome and titanic images of shockingly familiar pattern. There in the dark, unclean yig and hideous tulu squatted eternally, glaring at each other across the passage as they had glared since the earliest youth of the human world. From this point onward, I ask no credence for what I tell, for what I think I saw. It is too utterly unnatural, too utterly monstrous and incredible, to be any part of sane human experience or objective reality. My torch, though casting a powerful beam ahead, naturally could not furnish any general illumination of the Cyclopean crypt, so I now began moving it about to explore the giant walls little by little. As I did so, I saw to my horror that the space was by no means vacant, but was instead littered with odd furniture and utensils and heaps of packages which bespoke a populous recent occupancy. No nitrous relics of the past, but queerly shaped objects and supplies in modern everyday use. As my torch rested on each article or group of articles, however, the distinctness of the outlines soon began to grow blurred, until in the end I could scarcely tell whether the things belonged to the realm of matter or to the realm of spirit. All this while, the adverse winds blew against me with increasing fury, and the unseen hands plucked malevolently at me and snatched at the strange magnetic talisman I wore. Wild conceits surged through my mind. I thought of the manuscript and what it said about the garrison stationed in this place. Twelve dead slave imbi, and six living but partly dematerialized freemen. That was in 1545. 383 years ago. What since then? Zamakona had predicted change, subtle disintegration, more dematerialization, weaker and weaker. Was it Grey Eagle's talisman that held them at bay, their sacred Tulu medal, and were they feebly trying to pluck it off so that they might do to me what they had done to those who had come before? It occurred to me, with shuddering force, that I was building my speculations out of a full belief in the Zamakona manuscript. This must not be. I must get a grip on myself. But, curse it, every time I tried to get a grip, I saw some fresh sight to shatter my poise still further. This time, just as my willpower was driving the half-seen paraphernalia into obscurity, my glance and torch beam had to light on two things of a very different nature two things of the eminently real and sane world, yet they did more to unseat my shaky reason than anything I had seen before, because I knew what they were, and knew how profoundly, in the course of nature, they ought not to be there. They were my own missing pick and shovel, side by side, and leaning neatly against the blasphemously carved wall of that hellish crypt. God in heaven! and I had babbled to myself about daring jokers from Binger. That was the last straw. After that, the cursed hypnotism of the manuscript got at me, and I actually saw the half-transparent shapes of the things that were pushing and plucking, pushing and plucking, those leprous Paleogean things with something of humanity still clinging to them, the complete forms, and the forms that were morbidly and perversely incomplete. All these, and hideous other entities, the four-footed blasphemies with ape-like face and projecting horn, and not a sound so far in all that nitrous hell of inner earth. Then there was a sound, a flopping, a padding, a dull advancing sound, which heralded beyond question a being as structurally material as the pickaxe and the shovel something wholly unlike the shadow shapes that ringed me in, yet equally remote from any sort of life as life is understood on the earth's wholesome surface. My shattered brain tried to prepare me for what was coming, but could not frame any adequate image. I could only say over and over again to myself, it is of the abyss, 
but it is not dematerialized. The padding grew more distinct, and from the mechanical cast of the tread, I knew it was a dead thing that stalked in the darkness. Then, oh God, I saw it in the full beam of my torch, saw it framed like a sentinel in the narrow passage between the nightmare idols of the serpent Yig and the octopus Tulu. Let me collect myself enough to hint at what I saw, to explain why I dropped torch and handbag and fled empty-handed in the utter blackness, wrapped in a merciful unconsciousness which did not wear off until the sun and the distant yelling and the shouting from the village roused me as I lay gasping on the top of the accursed mound. I do not yet know what guided me again to the earth's surface. I only know that the watchers in Binger saw me stagger up into sight three hours after I had vanished, saw me lurch up and fall flat on the ground as if struck by a bullet. None of them dared to come out and help me, but they knew I must be in a bad state, so tried to rouse me as best they could by yelling in chorus and firing off revolvers. It worked in the end, and when I came to, I almost rolled down the side of the mound in my eagerness to get away from that black aperture which still yawned open. My torch and tools, and the handbag with the manuscript, were all down there, but it is easy to see why neither I nor anyone else ever went after them. When I staggered across the plain and into the village, I dared not tell what I had seen. I only muttered vague things about carvings and statues and snakes and shaken nerves, and I did not faint again until somebody mentioned that the ghost sentinel had reappeared about the time I had staggered halfway back to town. I left Binger that evening, and have never been there since, though they tell me the ghosts still appear on the mound as usual. But I have resolved to hint here at last what I dared not hint to the people of Binger on that terrible August afternoon. I don't know yet just how I can go about it, and if in the end you think my reticence strange, just remember that to imagine such a horror is one thing, but to see it is another thing. I saw it. I think you'll recall my sighting early in this tale, the case of a bright young man named Heaton, who went out to that mound one day in 1891 and came back at night as the village idiot, babbling for eight years about horrors and then dying in an epileptic fit. What he used to keep moaning was, that white man Oh my God, what they did to him! Well, I saw the same thing that poor Heaton saw, and I saw it after reading the manuscript, so I know more of its history than he did. That makes it worse, for I know all that it implies, all that must be still brooding and festering and waiting down there. I told you it had padded mechanically toward me out of the narrow passage and had stood sentry-like at the entrance between the frightful idola of Yig and Tulu. That was very natural and inevitable, because the thing was a sentry. It had been made a sentry for punishment, and it was quite dead, besides lacking head, arms, lower legs, and other customary parts of a human being. Yes, it had been a very human being once, and what is more, it had been white. Very obviously, if that manuscript was as true as I think it was, this being had been used for the diversions of the amphitheater before its life had become wholly extinct and supplanted by automatic impulses controlled from outside. On its white and only slightly hairy chest, some letters had been gashed or branded. I had not stopped to investigate but had merely noted that they were in an awkward and fumbling Spanish, an awkward Spanish implying a kind of ironic use of the language by an alien inscriber familiar neither with the idiom nor the Roman letters used to record it. The inscription had read, Sequestrado a la voluntad de Shinayan en el cuerpo decapitado de Tlayub. Seized by the will of Knayan, 
in the headless body of Tlayob. 